We've been talking about, for a month or so, I guess, about being overcomers. And that is, that is yet on my heart again this morning. Um, and, I, and I feel led to teach along those lines again. In, in the past year, God has been trying to teach us much about his kingdom. Everybody say the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. That, that, is, that is what God is trying to establish in our hearts is his kingdom, his rule, his authority, his dominion. And when his, his kingdom, his authority is truly established in our lives to where we have completely given up our own kingdoms, our own desires, our own wills, and we are living according to his perfect will, that should produce something in us. That's the benefit of the kingdom of God is that when I am born into the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God is then established, his ways, his laws are established in my heart and in my life. The kingdom of God produces citizens. Right? We are citizens in the kingdom of God. That's why the writer said that uh, we, we, we are pilgrims and strangers in this world. We are just passing through this world looking for a better city, a better place. And we are citizens of a kingdom not of this world. And being citizens of the kingdom of God, the benefit towards us in this life, salvation eternally, but in this life, the benefit of being a citizen in the kingdom of God is the kingdom of God, once we are born into it, we have been adopted by the Father into his kingdom. His laws then produce in us, make us overcomers. So the kingdom of God is made up of citizens who are learning to become overcomers. And we are learning to overcome this world and all that it entails. It's problems, it's trials, it's persecution, it's afflictions, it's sicknesses, it's diseases. We are learning to overcome all these things. So the kingdom of God within us changes us to be not only a citizen, but a citizen who becomes an overcomer. So these things tie together, the kingdom of God and being an overcomer very much tie together, right? That's what we've been talking about. I believe at some point I, I referenced this verse, but I want to start there this morning. Luke chapter number 13 and verse number 18. Once you find it, would you, would you turn to your neighbor and tell him, I want to be a citizen of the kingdom who overcomes. Right? Do you really feel that way? Right? Why? Why? It's not about church. Everybody's talking about joining churches. We're not interested in joining churches. We're interested in being born into the kingdom of God. And being born in the kingdom of God will, will then change us to be, once we're a citizen, to become an overcomer. And I can overcome everything in this world. Because my father, the king, will teach me how to, how to overcome. Watch this. Jesus was asked, Luke 13 and, and 18, he was asked about the kingdom of God. Notice what he says. So he was saying, what is the kingdom of God like and to what shall I compare it? He's trying to describe the kingdom of God to those that he's having this conversation with. Verse, verse 19, it is like a mustard seed. Right? Everybody's heard that from the time you've been raised in church. You've heard it all in mustard seed. Tiniest of all seeds. And we've heard many sermons preached on the power of the mustard seed. Watch this. It is like a mustard seed which a man took and threw into his own garden. And it grew and became a tree. And the birds of the air nested in its branches. We referenced this at some point. I can't remember when it was, but ever since then, it's been on my heart. And I've, I've been meditating on the word picture that Jesus drew here when he described the kingdom of God. 
It's like a mustard seed, the tiniest of all seeds. But a man threw it into his garden. And when it grows, after there's a process, there's a process of growing. Once it grows, it becomes a, a tree. And large enough to where now the birds of the air nested in its branches. So what starts out as something very insignificant and small eventually grows into becoming a place of refuge for those around it. This, this, this one verse here, there's so much to learn from this. I was meditating on this at some point recently and the, the thought occurred to me, you know, what do birds eat? Seeds. That's what their diet primarily consists of. Birds love seeds. And so what, what, what initially is sown, which is enough for the bird to come and consume it before it even grows. Jesus even tells us a parable about the fowl of the air that come and steal away the seed before it has time to take root and grow. So what that they can consume, what that they can come against, that seed... Once it grows, a bird can't eat a tree. But the tree will become a place to where the bird can come and find safety. So what it once would have consumed now becomes its place of refuge. And when I start thinking about that, that image and, and converting that over to how the kingdom of God is planted into every one of our hearts as a seed. And many people who hear about the kingdom of God, the, the, the enemy comes and steals it away out of their heart. The deceitfulness of riches choke the word. That whole parable of the soul applies to all lives. But, but to those of us who are good soil. And we receive the seed of the kingdom into our life. And we begin to allow the laws of God, the ways of God, the word of God to teach us and train us. What God is trying to produce in us is something that the enemy could ultimately consume in the beginning. Now becomes a place where we have influence over it. I think so many times, well, I'll speak from my own, my own personal experience. I've oftentimes wondered, why is it that I don't have more influence in people's lives than I do? If I'm truly a citizen of the kingdom of God, Jesus had influence in people's lives. Paul had influence in people's lives. The apostles had influence in people's lives. They were turning the world upside down with the gospel. And, and I've often wondered, why is it that we, we don't see maybe that same kind of result, at least to some degree. I'm not ex expecting to be the Apostle Paul. But to some degree, I want to be fruitful. I want to produce. I want to be able to influence people for the cause of the kingdom. And I think there's a spiritual dynamic that's going on in a situation like this to where when the kingdom is, is put in our life in seed form, it doesn't have impact on, the, on anybody around us. But through the process of growth, once we're born into the kingdom of God, then we become, we're infants in Christ, we're infants in the spirit. We grow into that adolescent stage that we've been talking about the last few weeks. Then ultimately what we're trying to get to is that adult stage spiritually to where we're not swayed and tossed to and fro with, the, with emotions. We, there's got to be a growth. The kingdom just can't remain a seed in our lives. The goal is to grow in the kingdom. Grow into what? Grow into an overcomer. Because people are looking for overcomers. People are drawn to those who have overcome what they're facing right now. Is that true? 
But when we're struggling on the same level they're struggling with, how can we help them? They have no place to come and rest and find lodging in our lives because we are still, it's still in seed form in us. But if we grow, we become a great tree and the birds of the air can nest in our branches. That, that concept right there is powerful. That's what God is trying to produce in every one of our lives. He's planted the seed of the word of God, the kingdom of God in our hearts. And now we're in a process of growing. But what he wants us to get to is to be such an overcomer that people who are wrestling with the things that we have overcome have a place where they can run to and find safety. Right? I want people to be able to look at my life and see he has gone through what I've gone through and feel a compulsion I can find help there in him I can find instruction there in him I can find comfort and encouragement there in his life right talking personally but how many of you feel the same way I want people around me, family members, friends, people that I'm in contact with. I want them to sense in me the kingdom of God being so great and producing fruit to where they feel drawn to come and take up rest. So that the seed of God, it's not about me, but bringing them to me so that I can sow the kingdom of God into their lives. They become a great tree. And it's a cycle by which the kingdom of God is expanded into all the earth. That's the plan of God. Watch this. Thinking along these lines led me to a couple of other verses, passages that I want to share with you this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. And uh, I'm going to go through this chapter as quickly as I can. I don't want to belabor the point, but I do want to. Some very powerful principles here. Paul writing to the saints at Corinth. And, and this is an interesting book to me. Always has been an interesting. 2 Corinthians is way more interesting to me than 1 Corinthians. And maybe it's because, I, I don't know, maybe because of where I'm at in my life. But really the, the point of 2 Corinthians is Paul is trying to get the Corinthians to develop ministry in their own life. And he's using himself as an example throughout the entire book. When you read even... Um, it starts in chapter 4, that this ministry that God has given us. And then he goes into describing it. I don't have time to read, you know, eight chapters of 2 Corinthians today. You read it this week when you get some time studying and praying God, praying to God and asking for understanding. But I'm going to start right here in 2 Corinthians 6. Watch what he says. And working together with him. That's, that's, he's talking about ministry. The context of all of this is ministry. We're working together with him. We also urge you... Not to receive the grace of God in vain. In other words, what God has given you, he expects a return on it. Right? Jesus talked about uh, the wicked and slothful servant that received the talent, went and hid it in the earth. He didn't produce any return. When the master came back, he got rebuked for it. Paul is, Paul is using that same principle here and saying working together with God we're, we're kingdom ambassadors now. As we have received the kingdom into our life, he expects us to expand the kingdom into the hearts and lives of others. And working together with him, we also urge you not to receive this grace. And grace is charis, gift, a gift, the grace, the gift of God in vain. Verse 2. For he says, at the acceptable time, I listen to you. And on the day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And this, this scripture is always quoted in, in the context of evangelism. Right? When we hear this, you always hear a preacher get up and say, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. And there's truth to that. I'm not saying that's not true. But I'm saying I think we're missing a lot when we ignore context. Because the context of what Paul's writing right here is not just salvation. It's ministry. Right. 
Not only does God want to save you, He wants to use you to save others. And we don't want to receive His grace in vain. So the context here is ministry. Watch as he continues on. You'll see this. Verse 3. Giving no cause for offense in anything. We have got to have the mindset. This is, he's getting ready to describe the mindset of an overcomer. The citizen of the kingdom, that's what he's trying to make a citizen of his kingdom. He's trying to produce in you the ability to overcome everything. Whatever life brings against you to overcome it. Giving no calls for offense. You ain't got time to get offended with somebody. You've got to overcome offense. Why? Giving no calls for offense in anything so that the ministry will not be discredited. And I started thinking, we have so many people that are upset about this and upset about that. They ain't helping nobody, but they're mad because you're not helping them. And they get offended at all these things. When our mentality as, as overcomers is not to just constantly be looking for somebody to help me, but to have grown to a spiritual state to where that I can help others. We don't have time to be offended. We should be at the level of, men that's what we're seeking, to attain that level of spiritual maturity in ministry to where we overcome the temptation to be offended. Giving no calls for offense in anything so that the ministry will not be discredited. Watch how, how, how deep this goes. But in everything, in everything, commending ourselves as servants of God, ambassadors of the kingdom of God, in much, remember we talked about last week, sometimes overcoming is not necessarily a change in your circumstances. Sometimes overcoming is enduring through your circumstances. That same mentality of an overcomer Paul's addressing here. In everything, commending ourselves as servants of God, but in much endurance, in afflictions, in hardships, in distresses, overcoming all these things in beatings. How many of you have been beat for the gospel's sake lately? <laughs> Not physically. Spiritually and emotionally we take a beating sometimes. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think he's talking about physical beatings here though, to be honest, I think. In beatings, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors. It's a labor to minister to others. In sleeplessness, in hunger, like he's literally not having his needs met, his basic physical needs, but yet he still has the mentality that even though I'm hungry, I'm not going to get offended with everybody not supplying my need, I'm going to keep ministering to others. That, that level of overcoming, that the ministry not be discredited. Verse 6, impurity, overcomers, overcoming temptation, be, remaining pure, undefiled. In knowledge, we got to continue to grow in the mysteries and knowing the mysteries of the kingdom of God. We got to continue grow, overcoming our ignorance, overcoming the traditions of men that we've been taught, and growing in the knowledge, the true knowledge. Of our Savior Jesus Christ, as Paul says in another epistle, in purity and knowledge, in patience, in kindness. These are fruits of the Spirit now listed in Galatians 5 patience, kindness. In the, remember, we talked about how overcoming is always linked to walking in the Spirit. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is speaking. The Spirit's gonna speak to you and tell you what? What's the Spirit gonna teach you? How to overcome all these things. So walking in the spirit is absolutely paramount. You can't be an overcomer without learning to listen to the spirit leading in your conscience and in your intuition. In the Holy Spirit, in genuine love, not lip service. Not I love you, bro. Yes, true love, genuine love. Right? This is the mindset of an overcomer. 
an over, a spiritual, spiritually mature overcomer that has become a tree. Now he's learning to minister to everybody else, to be a place of refuge for, for those around him. In the word of truth, in the power of God, by the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left, meaning being fully equipped, fully taught, fully trained in the things of God. God's going to add to you whatever you lack. To give you the weapons of righteousness to go forth and minister to other people to expand the kingdom of God. Verse 8. By glory, watch this. Watch the contrast. He, gives, he contrasts two extremes in the next few verses. Watch these extremes, these parallels he draws. Sometimes it'll be glorious. Sometimes everybody's going to be wanting, oh, you're so wonderful. And then you go to sleep and wake up and can't find nobody to give you honor. Everybody's attacking. Everybody's persecuting. But Paul's saying we, we, it doesn't matter what state we find there. If it's glory, great. If it's dishonor, doesn't matter. I'm not tossed to and fro. I don't minister or stop ministering based on glory or dishonor. I overcome both. You say, well, how would you have to overcome glory? Pride. Because when everybody's throwing honor your way, it's easy to become lifted up in pride. So even when we're being honored, honor is an opportunity to overcome. Overcome what? Pride. So we overcome in all these. Good and bad. Citizens overcome. That's what they do. Citizens of the kingdom of God overcome. In the good, what do I do? Overcome. In the bad, what do I do? Overcome. And through overcoming, I grow to where I, I become spiritually mature enough that other people can look to my life and be drawn to me to find out how is it that you overcome all these things. And then I sow the kingdom into their life. And they grow. It's beautiful. By glory and dishonor, by evil report, and good report regarded as deceivers and yet we're speaking nothing but the truth right we, what do we do in times like this we're regarded as deceivers and yet we're speaking the truth what do we do we overcome do we sit back and get bitter and start hating the people that are calling us deceivers or do we learn to be perfected in love even loving our Enemies, we overcome, we overcome evil with good. And even while we're regarded as deceivers yet true, watch this. This is beautiful. And I'm moving fast because i got somewhere else I want to go. But I, I pray that you write this down. Study these, think and meditate and pray on these passages. As unknown, yet well known. That's a powerful statement. The, the world may not know. We may not be famous as far as the world is concerned. Yet, when it comes to the kingdom, the king, we're well known. Ah, that, that goes deep. Watch this. As dying... Yet behold, we live. That's a powerful statement. As though even though our circumstances may cave in around us and it looks like we're dying, and ultimately we are physically, but we understand that in the kingdom of God, death is not the end. Physical death I'm talking about. Physical death is not the end. Physical death is simply a transition from one life to the next. So even though I may be physically dying, yet, as a citizen in the kingdom of God, I don't die. I am alive, spiritually speaking. Now, I believe that can also apply, that principle can also apply to what we're going through in our lives. My circumstances, everybody else looks like 
you're dying. Your life is falling apart. You're being persecuted. You're not rich. You're not famous. You're not well spoken of. You're not well known. And though all these things look like death to the carnal mind, yet to the spiritual mind, we are very much alive. You say, well, why is that important? The, the reason this, this mentality right here is so important is because people give up on their faith because they don't understand th th this principle that even though your circumstances may be cr crumbling and, and life seems to be dying all around you, yet in, in, in Christ, in the Spirit, there is eternal life. That no matter what happens in my circumstances, God is going to bring me through this and when I come out of this, I'm going to be stronger, not weaker. So having this mentality helps us then to overcome when it looks like everything around us is dying. As punished, yet not put to death. We're persecuted, but not destroyed, he says in another place. Right? Punished, yet not put to death. They can punish that the world can punish us all they want to, but they can't. They can't kill us. They can't take from me what God has given to me. They, cannot they can steal all my worldly possessions, take it all away from me, but they cannot take the treasures of the kingdom which the Father has put in my life. I'm rich. I'm punished, yet not put to death. Let me continue here. As sorrowful... Yet always, that is the mindset of an overcomer. That though my circumstances around me may cause me to initially be faced with becoming sorrowful, down, discouraged, depressed, as sorrowful, yet understanding that I am to overcome sorrow, that mentality of overcoming, being a citizen of the kingdom of God, causes me to grow to where... No more sorrow, yet always I can rejoice in every situation because I can overcome sorrow. As poor, let me, let me, man, this is, I'm going to hit this and let you think on it for the next couple of days, okay? We've got to overcome both, right? We talk about overcoming sorrow and yet rejoicing. Woo, that's wonderful. What about, I think some people, don't ever overcome rejoicing. We become addicted to rejoicing. And when we're not rejoicing, let me put it this way. When somebody around us is suffering, the Bible says to weep with those who weep. But when we're in a state of rejoicing, because our circumstances are not producing sorrow at the moment, Yet we're in a state of rejoicing. Yet a brother or sister who is, who is in a state of sorrow, we can't come down from our pedestal. We don't want to be bothered. Right? So not only do we have to overcome sorrowful circumstances, we have to be willing to overcome rejoicing circumstances because ministry is what God has called us to. He hasn't called us to sorrowful or rejoicing. He's called us to ministry whether we are sorrowful or rejoicing. Right? So if I'm in a state of being blessed and you're in a state of where you're not so blessed and, and I just don't want to deal with you, I don't want to talk to you, it's too much, I don't, I don't, nah. You keep that over there. I'm good right now. Don't mess me up. We have to overcome that selfish mentality. I'm not saying you overcome rejoicing. We should always rejoice. But I'm saying you should not be so caught up and euphoric in your rejoicing that you are oblivious to the needs of those suffering around you. Even rejoicing has to be overcome sometimes. Right? As poor... Yet making ourselves rich. Did y'all catch that? Y'all rereading it. I see somebody staring at the screen like this. As poor yet making ourselves rich. It's not what he said. 
The whole point of an overcomer is what, how you can affect others. It's not even about you being rich. That I just talked about rejoicing. We're rich in rejoicing. So rich, I don't want to deal with somebody who's not rejoicing. But we have to be able to be poor, yet making, having the mentality of ministry to make everybody else rich. Overcome. God, I'll be here all day. As having nothing... It's powerful. That's the mentality of an overcomer, a citizen of the kingdom of God who's been taught to overcome. He started out, it started out as a seed in your heart. Now it has become the kingdom of God, has produced a great tree to where you have become a minister to other people. That's the goal. The goal is to not get so overcoming that I can be lifted up in pride myself at what I've accomplished. The goal is to overcome my circumstances so that I can become a place where others find refuge in my life, even in my struggles. Am I rich? Yeah, I'm rich because I can be in a sorrowful circumstance yet still have joy. That to me is rich. That's the riches of the kingdom of God. The man who's rich in this world's goods lays his head on his pillow at night stressed out because he's worried about making more or losing what he has. So his riches can't buy joy. But I can be broke as a joke and still be so spiritually mature that I can have joy in the midst of sorrow. Who's richer? He has money, but he can't buy joy. I don't have any money, but I have what he wants most. So I am rich. In learning to overcome, I become rich, but not so that I'm lifted up in pride. Why? So that I can help others to find the same treasures... That I have. That's the thing about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God in, in this world's riches. The more you give away, the less rich you become. That's why people are greedy. In the kingdom of God, the more you give away, the richer you become. It, it's a completely backwards economy. But we bring a carnal mentality into spiritual things. Right? We have this mentality, I can't give. If I give so much, I'm going to be broke myself. And we bring that mentality into the church. We're like, I got to grow. I got to grow my relationship with God. I got to get God to move in my circumstances. I got to get joy. I got to get peace. I got to get... Right? But, but what, what happens is... When we have the mentality to make many other people rich, God makes sure that we never lack. And what we're giving away, he gives unto us. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. Everybody thinks that's about money. This is about the riches of the kingdom. Things money can't buy. Some people can't receive it. Verse 11. Let me hurry, i got to go some more. Our mouth has spoken freely to you. We're not withholding anything from you. We're, we're, what the, the mysteries of the kingdom that have been revealed to me, I'm teaching you. That's what Paul's telling them here. Our mouth has spoken freely to you, O Corinthians. Our heart is open wide. I'm not withholding anything from you. I understand the more I give to you, the richer we all get in kingdom things. Twelve, you are not restrained by us. You are restrained. That is powerful. Right? Paul was dealing with the Corinthians and Paul became uh, frustrated with the Corinthians on a number, a number of occasions because when they should have been mature, they were still babies. So in a lot of states, in a lot of topics, in a lot of doctrines, Paul had to rebuke them and correct them and instruct them in righteousness. But 
He's saying, I'm giving everything God has given to me. I'm trying to give it to you all. I'm not restraining anything from you. I'm trying, as I give to you, God makes me richer. And I'm trying to get you operating on the same kingdom uh, uh, economy to get you doing the same thing. What you have received, you give and make many rich so that God can fill you up, so that we're all prosperous. Even as our soul prospers is the way John, the Apostle John put it. Now, he says, you are not restrained. Your ministry keeping you from being spiritually rich, you're not being restrained by me. I'm not holding you back. But you are being restrained. You don't want to minister. You don't desire, you don't have an affection to make somebody else rich. You have a mentality to come to church. Let the pastor feed me with knowledge. I become rich. But where are you giving it out? Who are you sharing this with? What has been poured into your life? Where is it being poured out unto others? Out of your belly shall flow. We're not dead seas. God doesn't... Give all his spiritual understanding and power and knowledge into us for us to contain it and hold on to it. And it's some secret that we're supposed to keep, keep from everybody in the world. This is not a secret. This, this thing was not done in, in a closet somewhere. It was supposed to be manifested to all the world. We are the light of the world. We are a city set on a hill which cannot be hid. But yet we're sitting in churches hiding what God has told us. And don't have a desire to share it with somebody else. So it's not that Paul is limiting us. It's not that God is limiting us. It's, we are restrained by our own affections. Powerful. Maybe what God is waiting on is for me to start giving to somebody else's life. When I, say, when I say ministry, everybody thinks pulpit or singing or keyboard or some, some other form of, of, I'm not even sure. That stuff is not the ministry that we need in our generation. We're rich in stuff like that. Well, you, you can turn on your iPod, you can listen to all kinds of music that's just the most talented musicians in the world. So we're rich in stuff like that. Where we're lacking is true ministry. Encouraging somebody who's struggling. Encouraging somebody who is struggling because they don't understand there's a better way. Because they don't understand the kingdom of God. How many Christians are struggling right now because they don't understand the kingdom of God? They, they, they claim to be Christians, but they're not under the authority of Christ. They're not living according to his teachings. They're not living according to his commandments. They just made a confession. Well, I believe that Jesus is the Savior, but they never understood the kingdom. He's not only your Savior, he is your Lord. And Savior. Everybody wants a Savior, nobody wants a Lord. That's what the kingdom of God is. The Father is King. Jesus Christ is Lord over all. So we are to obey His commandments. <laughs> but so many Christians think that they, they have access to the mysteries of the kingdom of God, the blessings of God, the peace, the joy, the righteousness. They think they have access because they believe that Jesus is the Christ. They believe that Jesus is their Savior. We have access to these things because we understand that Jesus is not only my Savior, He is my Lord. I've got to live by His commandments to access the treasures of the kingdom of God. And many Christians struggle because they don't understand the kingdom of God. They understand belief in Christ, but they don't understand that Christ is Lord. That's deep. 
How many people do you know as Christians are struggling because they don't understand the kingdom of God? If they understood the kingdom of God, then they could understand overcoming. And if they understood, over, if they understood overcoming, then they could escape their problems. They could have joy even if they don't escape their problems. But they lack these overcoming and the rewards of being a citizen of the kingdom because they're not under submission to the, the king. So it's my responsibility to live my life under submission to the king. Let that fruit be produced in my life so that they can come to me and see this is how it works. And they as well can escape the corruption that is in this world through lust, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. They, they, we struggle because of these things. We are restrained because of our, our own affections. That's so deep. Thirteen. Now, in a like exchange, I speak as to children. Open wide to us. Also, we've opened ourselves, Paul's writing as the apostle, I've, I've opened myself to you, I've taught you everything that God and Christ have taught me. So I want you now to open yourself wide to us also. I've ministered to you, now you need to, we, that's the beauty of the body of Christ, is the body edifies itself in love. What modern church has reduced itself to is a few gifted people who open themselves wide to minister to others but everybody else just comes to be entertained. They don't leave with the mentality what I learned, I've got to share with somebody else. How can I pour what I've learned into somebody else's life? Now in like exchange I speak as to children open wide to us also, verse 14. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. Now, he's taught them the mentality of an overcomer. Now, he's, he's sending you forth as lambs in the midst of wolves. He's sending you forth to deal with people who are not walking according to the principles of the kingdom of God, but they're walking according to the course of the prince of the power of the air, lust and greed and pride and anger and wrath and jealousy. So you're going into this, you're going to minister to people who are engrossed with that culture while you yourself are supposed to be set apart and of another culture. The culture of the kingdom of God. So do not be bound together with unbelievers. You're going in to minister to them to be a tree where they can come and lodge in what you have. But don't go into them and then start thinking like them and acting like them. You can't let them overcome you. You've got to overcome them with the principles of the kingdom. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's the kingdom of God. He's the king. We are the citizens of his kingdom. And not only are we citizens, we are adopted as children. We're adopted citizens. Beautiful. Therefore, come out from their midst. You've got to come out of their kingdom the kingdoms of this world, and you've got to come into the kingdom of God, come out from them, from their midst, and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch that which is unclean, and I will welcome you. Right? So come out of the kingdoms of this world, into the kingdom of God, let the kingdom of God produce in you how to become an overcomer, and then they that are in the world can come to you or actually we in turn go back to them. I think that's, that's, maybe that's the best way to word it. Because I think when they come to us, we have the mentality sit here in church and wait till they show up at church. That's not what he's teaching. Right? Jesus said go into all the world. Not get all the world to come into the church. Right? So we come out of the world in the sense of escaping its way of doing things, living for yourself, submitting yourself to the king. You come into the kingdom of God. You grow up. 
and, and then you can be used in the world to set other people free. Right? Is that it? Then one more verse. And I will be a father to you. Citizens in the kingdom of God, but yet we are adopted children who have become citizens. And I will be a father to you, and I will be, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Somebody say the kingdom of God. It is, it, he is working in us to produce citizens who are, who are overcomers. I'm going to continue on. Give me, um, give me 2 Corinthians 9. Go three chapters. Um, for the sake of time, let me skip to verse 5. All right, so to give you context here, um, Paul in the, first, the previous verses of this chapter is there's an offering that he is raising from the Corinthians to go and be a benefit to another group of people, right? So he's talking to them about that offering. Watch what he says about their ministry in this sense. So I thought it necessary to urge the brethren that they would go on ahead to you and arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gift, talking about a financial offering, so that the same would be ready as a bountiful gift and not affected by covetousness. We talked about this a few months ago, the whole dynamic going on here, but I'm not getting into all that today. Verse 6. Now this I say, he who sparingly shall reap sparingly and he who sows bountifully will also this came up Wednesday night in our discussion when we were talking about financial giving right he's talking about physical financial giving I don't know if they're giving money I don't know if they're giving food goods whatever the case may be but they were taking of their own physical goods and they were giving to another people so it's talking about a physical act of of giving in some sort of way that's very tangible maybe is the best way to describe it and then he, he, he states this here as it relates to tangibly giving. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. We talked about that Wednesday night. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. I don't believe this just relates to physical things. When, when you couple this principle with all the other scriptures in the Bible that talk about how we are to minister to one another that have nothing to do with physical giving, tangible giving of financial gifts, but how that we spend time with one another and we encourage one another and we bless one another and, and preach to and teach one another and bear one another's burdens. We see that constantly throughout the scriptures that we are to minister to one another in love. So this principle, I don't believe, is just limited to just financial. I believe many of us may be reaping sparingly Concerning ministry, I'm not even talking about physical things right now. Concerning, our, concerning peace and joy and righteousness and love. Are we reaping sparingly because we're sowing sparingly? Most everyone that's ever, that has got back to me, a lot of times they don't, but anytime it's gotten back to me, it's like, well, I'm just nobody's loving me enough, talking about the church, take or right here specifically. Nobody loves me enough. I, I sit back and think about the people who are saying that in, in, in just about every single case, that person gives nothing to nobody. They don't call anybody. They don't encourage anybody. They don't try to minister to anybody. They come... They get mad when people don't show them attention and affection. When they themselves aren't showing attention and affection to anybody at any time for any reason. Reaping sparingly because they're sowing sparingly. They're bringing that mentality in. If I give it away, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be broke. They're bringing that carnal mentality into a spiritual atmosphere. You're not going to go broke by showing other people love. <laughs> you become rich in love by giving love. 
Because if you give of yourself to somebody when they're down and they're struggling, they're, naturally, it's easy, to, it's easy to love somebody who has loved you, right? Jesus taught us that. Even the Gentiles can do that. They don't understand anything about spiritual gifts. But if Elder Waldron has showed me love, constantly showed me love when I was down, when I was discouraged, when I needed something physically, he gave to my need. He was constantly there showing love on many diff- in many different ways. When, 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 when I find him struggling, I don't want to run the other way. I want to. It's easy to then... Finally, I get an opportunity to give back to him. He's given so much to me. Now he needs something. And I get the opportunity to repay him, repay him back. So from his perspective, he's given love, given love, given love. And then to all those people he's given love to, when he struggles himself, now all those people can in turn pour back into him and he can feel loved in return, and it's a natural cycle. He's not forcing anybody to love him. He's not begging anybody to love him. I need your love. I'm mad because you don't love me. Right? He reaps bountifully because he's sown bountifully. Right? And nobody's, now y'all go make sure that you show Elder Walter some love. He's struggling right now, everybody. (laughs) Nothing like that has to be said because it's genuine, it's sincere. Right? True love, genuine love he talked about earlier. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly shall reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Yes, it talks about physical giving, but I feel like it's applying to spiritual aspects as well. Watch this. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly, right, or under compulsion, for God loves A cheerful giver. What does that mean? What does it mean that God loves a cheerful giver? When he sees you are giving out of the willingness of your heart, God's love is then manifested towards such a person who's not doing it out of compulsion. You're doing it out of compulsion. The Bible doesn't say God loves somebody who's compulsed to give. It says he loves those who choose to give without compulsion. And so the love of God is manifested towards the person. He's giving, so I'm going to, that's what love is. It's giving. Remember we talked about that months ago. The love of God is to sacrifice what one has for the benefit of someone else. That's love. Love is not a word. I love you. Well, show me. Right? So when God loves us, he doesn't just come and say, well, I love you. Good luck. God's love is manifested in us even in, in, to this degree that even while we were yet sinners, when we were in need, God gave his only begotten son so that we might not be lost but have everlasting life. So God gave something of himself as a benefit to us. That's, lo- that's true love. So God loves a Cheerful giver. Well, I don't know about that, Pastor, but I ain't real sure. I ain't, I ain't sure that, you know, if I give to other people, and I'm not just talking about fin- financially, yes, but in many other ways as well, when I give to other people, God loves that. And you're saying God is going to give to me because I give to others? Verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. He that sows bountifully reaps bountifully. But he that sows sparingly reaps 
sparingly. Watch this, verse 9. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the taker. God doesn't give seed to the taker. Right? Now we've heard this abused in the context of physical things. So like when you read verses like this, some people just have an aversion to it and they're like, nah, don't want to deal with it. But what, I'm, I'm not even talking about physical things. Does it apply to physical things? Yes. The whole context right here in this chapter is physical giving, tangible, tangibly giving of physical goods. But it also applies to ministry. Now he who supplies, he gives seed not to the taker. He gives seed to the sower. God loves a cheerful giver. And God will make sure that the sower has seed to keep on sowing. You will not go bankrupt giving yourself away. The only way you go bankrupt, and I've been there, you know, how do you know this, Pastor Brantley? I've been there. The reason we go bankrupt when we feel like we're giving so much and trying to minister to other people, the reason we go there is because we don't understand kingdom principles. We bring a carnal mindset into spiritual, a spiritual condition. Well, if I give of myself so much, how am I, how am I going to have anything left? And you bring a carnal mentality into, and because of that carnal mindedness, that double mindedness, let not the double minded man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. So the love that you're giving out, you do go bankrupt on it because you're loving out of compulsion, obligation. You feel like it's expected of you. You're not loving because you want to love, you're not loving because you're cheerful about loving. You're loving because you're scared God's going to spank you if you don't love. God doesn't give seed to the taker. He gives seed to the cheerful, willing sower. This is beautiful. Now he supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed. That's that's. Kingdoms of this world, you give, you'll get broke. Kingdom of God, you give, you get rich. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for the food and supply and will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Man. You will be enriched in everything. For all for what? For so you can give it liberally. You will be enriched in everything for liberality. You will be enriched in everything for your own sake. No, he's giving it for you to give it away. And the more you give away, the more you get. We've got to get out of this mentality, this carnal-minded mentality. We're trying to do spiritual things with a carnal mentality. We're trying to do things out of obligation. When we should get a revelation of this, we should overcome the mentality of obligation. I don't give because I'm obligated. I don't give because God's going to curse me if I don't. I give because I want to be a blessing to everybody else around me. And that mentality releases God. Then I become a river. Instead of a, a swamp. Verse 9. For the ministry of this service, the, for the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God, man, it's a beautiful cycle. 
Not, not these negative cycles where we're tossed to and fro, but a beautiful cycle of whatever I give away, God gives back to me and much more so that everybody is prosperous. Because of the proof given by what? Ministry. They will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the, really? what did he say you were going to be enriched for? Enri enriched for all liberality of your contribution to them and to every, and everything else, everybody else that you're giving to, ministering to. While they also, by prayer on your behalf, yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you, grace. That's a whole different Bible study. Thanks be to God for his indescribable. You can't put this kingdom economy into words. It's indescribable. Is that it? That's powerful. God has sown seeds into every life in this place. Through the teaching of the word, through being in his presence, through prayer. We have received so much from God by way of understanding, by way of instruction in righteousness, in what, by way of doctrine. God has blessed us tremendously. He's sown seed after seed after seed after seed in our heart. But... but are those seeds, are we allowing those seeds to be stolen away by the enemy? Or are we guarding those seeds and more importantly, cultivating those seeds? Because remember, the mustard seed is small when it's sown, but it becomes a tree. What are you doing with what God has given you so far? Where are we at in our giving where are we at? And when I say giving, I'm not, even, I'm not even talking about financially. I'm talking about investing time into other people's lives. I'm talking about looking around for those suffering and encouraging them in the things of the kingdom. I'm, I, I'm not talking about pulpit ministry or platform ministry. Like that ain't even a biblical term. Right? I'm not even sure there was much music going on in the New Testament. They were singing. Two verses in the whole New Testament talk about singing. And yet the whole church has become dominated with music now. That's all anybody ever cares about. Let's go, how, how's, how's the music? <laughs> what they were concerned about, that the reason I bring that up, I'm not saying that music doesn't play a place, that music's not important. Sure, music is important. It plays a role in worship. We thank God for music. But music is not the goal of the New Testament. The goal of the New Testament is the kingdom of God being sown into the hearts of people and then those people taking those seeds cultivating it growing and maturing that they become an overcomer and that they so grow that they can then become a safe place of refuge and ministry and provision of love and kindness and, and, and whatever that person needs that's what we can become We've got to get out of this. We've got to grow out of this mentality of come. Let me be taught something. Let's see what they got to teach today. And, and, and I, we should get to the place to where service becomes a small part of our relationship with God. And that most of our relationship with God, the great majority of our relationship with God, takes place outside these four walls. To where I'm living my life in such a state that I'm looking for somebody to pour into. 
I'm looking for a brother or sister who's struggling in their faith to encourage them, not, not rebuke them. That's not the place of another saint of God. That's what elders are for, to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. That's the role of an elder. But the role of a saint is to encourage, to bear the burden. Where there's no joy, try to impart joy. Where there's no understanding, try to impart understanding. Kingdom principles. Submission to God. Submission to God's ways. So that that person can come out of that trial. But do we do that? We minister in so many ways. We can minister to others in encouragement. We can minister to others in worship. Worship, is, though, it's a, though it should be a smaller part than it is now, worship is, is a place to minister. When we come in and everybody's worshiping, it makes it, there's a liberty for somebody else to, to worship. But when we come in and we're not worshiping and everybody's just kind of standing around twiddling their thumbs, so in that way, we become, our, our sincere worship to God does in turn become a ministry to somebody else and you ain't even on the platform. But your ministry is just as important as the person playing the keyboard or singing the songs. Right? We, can, we, we encourage one another. Giving our time, our effort, our energy to somebody else. God has sown so much into us. But it's up to us. Am I going to be rich in the kingdom of God? Or am I going to continue to be poor in the kingdom of God? Right? Because he gives to the sower, not the reaper. He gives to the sower. What about ministering to people who are not even a part of this body? What about ministering to the co-worker, the friend, the family member who maybe is... You know, maybe they're, maybe, they're, maybe they're not. It's hard to find people who are not Christians. Now, in the South, no, everybody's saved. Joint in one hand, bearing the other. Yeah, I'm saved. I'm living in adultery, living in fornication. Yeah, I'm saved. Yeah. Say, yeah, I'm a Christian. But are you in the kingdom of God? Right? Christ didn't come preaching Christianity. The term was first used at Antioch. We're talking about decades after Christ came. Then the term Christian came to be. And it wasn't even because the church chose it. The secular world placed the title Christians upon the saints. We're not perpetuators. Christ didn't call us to preach Christianity. I'm not, I'm not against it. Christianity's fine. Don't, don't leave saying, well, I can't call myself a Christian no more. Just, you need to have understanding. Christ didn't call us to preach Christianity, religion. He called us to preach the kingdom of God. He didn't call us to preach my church. Lord, help me. How many people, when you talk to them, first thing out of their mouth is, oh, you've got to come see my church. My pastor can preach. Our choir is hot. Our choir kills it. You need to come to my church. Christ didn't call anybody to preach your church. What Christ came, the first thing Christ came preaching is the kingdom of God. Everybody's preaching church now. Christ wants us preaching the kingdom of God. Because you can sit in church all your life and be broke as a joke spiritually. Rich in this world's goods and broke According to the spiritual economy, you have no peace, you have no joy, you have no righteousness, you have no ability to overcome anything that you face, you're a victim of your circumstances. You can sit in church all your life and that be the description of your life. But a person who is sold and born, not sold into, born into the kingdom of God, they're living under God's authority, his rules, his commandments. God is producing in them to be a citizen, an overcomer. That's where we're at. God is sowing in us the kingdom of God. 
But now it's, start, it's, it's time to get the focus off of us and start getting the focus on it's, it shouldn't be a seed in my life anymore. It should be a tree. At the very least, a small bush. Right? And I'm working towards it. I'm cultivating it continuously until it does become a tree. But I can't be a seed hot, hidden in the earth for the rest of my days. At some point, I've got to grow. Right? That's what I feel. That, that's my heart. That's what I feel God is calling us to. He's sown so many things into us. And when I'm talking about ministry today, I'm not even talking about what goes on in this building. When I'm talking about your ministry, I'm talking about what goes on outside of this building. In your one-on-one -on -one conversations. Either with people, maybe they claim Christianity. I kind of got on the sidetrack there. I'll try to go it again. Maybe they claim Christianity, but they not really, they don't understand the kingdom of God. They need to be taught the kingdom of God. That's a whole mission field within this. I just described the great majority of people who live in our geographical area. Churchy. Churchites, churchins, churchians, right? People who go to church, but they, they're, not sit, they're not born into the, the kingdom of God, right? So we, that's a complete mission field all by itself. But then also people who are, they don't claim Christianity, atheists, whatever the case may be. Whoever God sets before us is an opportunity for us to establish what is growing in our own lives. That we sow seeds into their lives as well. Ministry. Understanding that God gives seed to the sower, not the reaper. So we've reaped long enough. It's time for every one of us to be mature enough to start living an active life. Practicing sowing in every day of our life. We got some things to pray about. We got some things to meditate about the next few days, the next few weeks to start thinking, God, how can I start getting in this habit, this lifestyle of sowing the kingdom and to, to, being, to ministering and sowing the seeds of the kingdom into everybody's heart that I come in contact with. Stand with me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we lift our hands. We lift our hearts. We lift our minds. Spirit, soul, and body, everything we have, everything we are, we present before you. You are the king of glory. This is your kingdom. We are your children. We are your citizens. And you have called us, Father, to be ambassadors, kingdom ambassadors, to go and spread the kingdom into other people's hearts and minds, that we be sowers. We thank you, Father, for your richness in mercy and in grace and all that you've sown into us. We thank you for that. You have changed our lives. You have given us a better way of living. You've given us a more perfect understanding of how to live the human life in complete and total surrender and submission to you and your kingdom, your ways. We thank you for this, Father. But today we feel you calling us. It's time to not only be reapers, but to begin to be sowers. You're looking for sowers. You're looking for those who will go out into the field and work and labor, sowing seeds into the lives and hearts of those that they come in contact with. Help me today, Father. I want my mentality to be changed. If I have developed a habit of being selfish, of being only a reaper, of only, only looking for what I can get out of you and out of church and out of my relationship with others in this building, I repent of that today, Father. I want my mind to be changed. Transform my mind. Renew my mind today, Father, to come into alignment with your word. To come into alignment with the principles of your kingdom. To understand kingdom economics. 
I'm broke spiritually because I don't sow spiritually. I want to change that today. I want to be those, an overcomer that reaps bountifully because I sow bountifully. Change me, Father. Come on, saints, lift your voice right now. Let's seek him. Change me. Transform me, God. Let this mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus, who took upon him the role of a servant. Father, that we would do the same, that we would serve as Christ served. And because Christ served, you elevated him and gave him a name, an authority that is above all other authorities. That at the authority of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. To the glory of you, Father. And Father, we desire the same, to adopt the mind of Christ, to, to make ourselves servants of all, to become sowers of the seeds of your kingdom. Use me, Father. Help me break out of all this selfishness and pride that keeps me from reaching out to others that holds me back from starting conversations with people and asking questions to pique their curiosity father forgive me of the pride we pray father as the apostles prayed grant us boldness that we may minister your word that we may expand your kingdom. Being bold. Not boldness to rebuke. Not boldness to attack. But boldness to love. Boldness to love. To love every person, even our enemies that are persecuting us, that we be perfected in love, that we be as perfect, Father, as you who are in heaven. That was Jesus' commandment to us. I want to give to others, be a blessing to others, and I want to do this cheerfully, willfully, not of compulsion. Change me, Father. Transform me by the renewing of my mind that I may prove what is your good and acceptable and perfect will. And your will for our lives is to expand your kingdom. And you give seed to the sowers. We thank you for your word. Father, I pray that your spirit would continue to deal with us. In the next coming days, in the next coming weeks, that we not be hearers only, but we be doers of this. That we practice this. And we give you all praise and glory and honor. Hallelujah. Let's praise him for his word. Let's praise him for his spirit that perfects us. He's trying to perfect us today. He's trying to make us citizens and overcomers. We praise you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are worthy. King of glory, you are worthy. You are worthy of our praise. Hallelujah. Glory and honor, power and dominion be unto you who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your example of selfless sacrifice. And we want to take up our cross and follow in your steps. Go and do likewise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.